after the Epiphany, Epistle from St. Paul the Apostle to the Romans, Brethren, having different gifts according to the grace that is given us, either, either prophecy to be used according to the rule of faith, or ministry in ministering, or, or he that teacheth in doctrine, he that exhorteth in exhorting, he that giveth with simplicity, he that ruleth with carefulness, he that showeth mercy with cheerful, cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation, hating that was, which is evil, cling to that which is good, loving one another with the charity of brotherhood, with honor, preventing one another, in carefulness, not slothful, in spirit, fervent, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, instant in prayer, communicating to the necessities of the saints, pursuing hospitality. Bless them that persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that rejoice, weep with them that weep, being of one mind, one towards another, not minding high things, but consenting to the humble. Continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. John. At that time there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother Jesus was there. And Jesus also was invited and his disciples to the marriage. And the wine failing, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what is that to me and to thee? My hour is not yet come. His mother said to the waiters, Whatsoever he shall say to you, do ye. Now there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three measures of a piece. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And Jesus said to them, Draw out now and carry to the chief steward of the feast. And they carried it. And when the chief steward had tasted the water and made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the waiters knew who had drawn the water, the chief steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man at first setteth forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Amaria, gracia plena, Domus tecum, benedicta tu rembus, et benedictus fructus ventis tu, Jesus. Santa Maria, Mater Dei, or Penosis Pecatoribus, Continuum, Amen. In this Sunday's Gospel, our Lord Jesus Christ performs his first public miracle at the wedding feast at Cana in Galilee. Through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, his Holy Mother. And as we heard in today's Gospel, Christ calls his mother woman, which is not disrespectful according to our way of thinking, but rather very honorable, for it means lady. In fact, she is the woman in the book of Genesis. She's a woman in the book of the Apocalypse, the militant woman in the militant church fighting the devil. The renowned Marian priest, 80 years ago, Father Emil Neubert, called her the Queen of Militants, and explains his title in his book. And he writes the following, Certainly we have heard it said that all graces come to us through Mary. Notice that we say through Mary, not from Mary. Grace has come to us from God. Mary only distributes it. Consider also that it is said that all graces come to us through Mary, 
And, that, and not that graces are given to us only if we pray to Mary. The Blessed Virgin Mary, in her incomparable goodness, obtains numerous graces, also for those who do not pray to her, for those who do not know her, even for those who blaspheme her. With this in mind, Catholic belief holds that from the Assumption of Our Lady until the end of time, all the grace that God gives to men are distributed by His Most Holy Mother. And why is this so? Because as Coridamtrix, with her son, she has done her part in meriting for us every grace that will ever be conferred. Is it not just that she, who has cooperated in the acquisition of all these spiritual riches, should also cooperate in their distribution, since she has acquired them for the only purpose of distributing them? Some of us may remember perhaps that at St. Joan of Arc's trial, one of the judges asked the accused why she carried her banner at the time of the crowning of the King of Reims. And St. Joan of Arc replied, my banner had sustained adversity, and so it was fitting that it should likewise share an honor. Likewise, the Blessed Virgin Mary, as a sorrowful mother, had also been subjected to suffering when she acquired these graces. Should she not be in a position of honor now when these graces are distributed? The popes Leo XIII, Pius X, Benedict XV, and Pius XI have emphasized this very point. To cite merely two of, the, of the, their texts, Pope St. Pius X declared, quote, Associated by Christ in the work of redemption, she merits de congruo, that is, in an inferior way, as the expression is, what Christ merits de continuo, that is, in strict justice, and is the principal minister in the distribution, distribution of grace. And from this community of will and suffering between Christ and Mary, she merited most worthily to become the reparatrix of the lost world and, and dispensatrix of all the gifts that our Savior purchased for us by his death and by his blood. And the quote from Pope St. Pius X. And his successor, Pope Benedict XV, affirmed this point when he said, quote, because of the union of the Blessed Virgin with Jesus in his redeeming passion, graces of every kind which we receive from the treasure of the redemption, are distributed to us, so to say, by the hand of the mother of sorrows. End of quote. And then Father Newbert says, have we ever considered that our, our role as a militant, as a member of the Milton Church, on a small scale, is the same as the role as the distributor or matrix of all graces. In short, what do we propose to do? We want to re-Christianize our society, do we not? And how do we go about re-Christianizing it? Suppose that we should speak with more ardor than the most eloquent orator that we are more intelligent than the cleverest businessman, and that we should work more spiritually, more fervently than the most active politician. Would we succeed by these means alone in making those around us live more deeply the life and the true faith of Christ, even in the least degree? Re-Christianizing our society causing men to live the life of Christ is evidently a supernatural work. And with natural means, we cannot produce supernatural effects, no more than we can produce intelligence from a block of wood. Supernatural results flow from the supernatural means, and the supernatural is the work of grace. 
Now, when we do the work of a militant, we want to bring those men who are living in a state of mortal sin to live the life of grace. We want those whose consciences are free from mortal sin, but who nevertheless allow themselves to be guided by principles foreign to those of Christ to live a more deeply spiritual life. And this is exactly what Mary desires. But she accomplishes this wish infinitely better than we do. She obtains grace for a man a thousand or a million times more easily than we do because she helped her son in meriting this grace for them and because she is the mother of of the author of grace. For every single person, the Blessed Virgin Mary obtains all the graces that are necessary for him from the day he is born until the day he dies. She obtains all graces for all men, for the billions of human beings who ever existed from the day of her assumption until now, and for those who will exist until the end of time, whereas we will obtain only a few graces for a handful of souls. The work of Christ was not finished at the hour of his death. Since then, all men do not automatically go to heaven, as partisans believe. Indeed, Jesus merited for all men the grace of salvation, but he wants to apply this grace to each man individually. It is like the case of a small town whose inhabitants are dying of famine. A rich benefactor sends an immense train of food. The people will still die of starvation if this food is not distributed to each of them individually. In like manner, the redemption requires an apostolate, that is, the application of the grace of the redemption to each soul. Without the apostolate, the redemption would not have its necessary completion. It would be useless, at least in great part. Our Lord Jesus Christ will continue to be the supreme militant until the end of time. In heaven, he intercedes for us with the Father. On earth, he raises up other militants to aid him. And these he animates with his spirit. Behold, I am with you, he said to his apostles when sending them as militants into the world. Behold, I am with you all days, even unto the consummation of the world. See Matthew 28, 20. All this we should understand very easily. But remember that Christ has willed to redeem us in union with Mary. Mary's work, like that of Christ, also calls for an apostolate. His work would not be achieved if at present the Blessed Virgin could not apply to each soul in particular this redemption, which she has already merited for all in general. There's a strange passage written by St. Paul in Romans 11.29 that goes like this, quote, For the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. What does this mean? St. Paul meant that God does not act like a human master, who having chosen a certain servant for some function, for which he later finds him unsuited, takes it away from him to confide to another servant, more trustworthy. Men change instruments because they are, not, they are ignorant and they do not know from the outset which instrument is the most appropriate. But God knows all things, and so he chooses, from the beginning, men whom he finds qualified, or rather, men to whom he has given the necessary qualifications. And then God supports them in their vocation unless by their sins they make themselves absolutely unworthy of his assistance, as was the case with Judas. Therefore, since God chose Mary to cooperate in our redemption, he will sustain her in this function until the end, that is, until each well-disposed soul is actually saved. 
Otherwise, God would be stopping his mother before her task was half accomplished. He would be calling her to start a work and then not, and then not permitting her to finish, to finish it, despite the fact that she always cooperated with him perfectly. Therefore, as our Lord Jesus Christ will, will always remain the supreme militant even to the end of the world, the Blessed Virgin Mary also will always remain a great militant, the Queen of Militants, in union with Christ. Like him, she is a militant in heaven by interceding with him for us, and on earth by raising up militants who will aid her and whom she will animate with her spirit. To these militants, she gives a very special power, Perhaps these statements astonish us, especially the word militant, taken in this explanation by Father Newbert, because we never reflected on the role of Mary. But did not God say already, in the very first prophecy in the, in the world, Genesis 3.15, quote, I will put enmities between thee and the woman, and thy seed and her seed, she shall crush thy head. To the end of time, there will be enmities between Satan and his seed on the one hand, and the woman and her seed on the other. And to the end of the world, the woman with her seed will crush his head. We have certainly seen many images and statues of the Immaculate Virgin with her foot placed on the head of the serpent. She crushed it in her Immaculate Conception. And she continues to crush it as long as there are enmities between Satan and Christ. The words of the Roman, Holy Roman Catholic Church echo this first prophecy when she sings in her liturgy, Rejoice, O Virgin Mary, because thou alone hast destroyed all heresies in the whole world. In other words, Mary has destroyed all perverse doctrines which lead men to their eternal ruin. And in her upcoming universal triumph of her Immaculate Heart, Our Lady will particularly destroy all the heresies infecting the Church, now, especially through that most wicked council, the Second Vatican Council. So, our Immaculate Heart and Mary, pray for us and save us. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.